As a land manager, you have a choice. You can either be proactive or you can be reactive. In the past, the objectives were primarily only for productivity of these lands, but yet these lands were not sustainable under those um, expectations. We know a lot more about what can be produced upon these lands today. We know its limits and we know its breaking points. Hello, I'm Chris Call. I'm a range scientist at Utah State University. I'm standing in a sagebrush ecosystem here in the Northern Great Basin, extremely important in terms of ecosystem services and also for, for livestock production. But it's one of the more imperiled ecosystems in North America. In this case, it's having problems with juniper encroachment from higher elevations and cheatgrass encroachment from lower elevations, resulting in habitat loss and fragmentation. Shrublands are a very important type of, type of landscape. Not only large game animals, which are very important to the economy of the area, but also um, birds, upland birds, that require them throughout their uh, life cycle. And as these important species are starting to diminish, the overall importance of sagebrush type lands is only heightened. Some of the primary drivers between the balance of shrubs and grasses historically has, has been fire and climate. But with the colonization by Europeans, they brought in some new pressures that these ecosystems hadn't really experienced before. Primarily the cultivation of land where soils are disturbed, sometimes on an annual um, basis. And overall, one of the uh, primary changes that has occurred is an overall loss of some of the herbaceous type species that are so um, fundamentally important. Fire regime started to change in the early 80s when cheatgrass really started to expand and start to connect lands and connect the size of the fires. So instead of having a smaller fire, we started seeing larger fires. As, as the fires got larger, cheatgrass just started to take over. Historically, areas that were dominated by sagebrush and an understory of perennial grasses that are both very long-lived um, would experience fires, but the occurrence of fires were uh, you know, much broader, probably about 25 to, up to upwards of 100 years. And as we go even to lower elevations within this region, some people have suggested that fires were uh, not even present in the past. And that was primarily because if there was a lightning strike or a fire to start from um, natural causes like that, there just wasn't the fuel being produced by per native perennial species to carry a fire. If uh, just the composition of species is still present within a site, there may be ways to um, manage a piece of land to uh, foster the existence of the remnant native species such that you really don't have to intervene too much and you can have um, change occur without a lot of active input. Okay, so Tom, we're standing in a, a cheatgrass dominated area now. We've moved from the sagebrush and the fires have occurred. The sagebrush has, has gone out of the system. Grazing at the right time of year when cheatgrass is most vulnerable in producing its seeds could reduce the amount of seeds being produced. Other types of treatments target other processes. For instance, um, fire reduces a lot of the litter here, but it also produces an ideal situation for a, a seed bank to be produced or the seed bed conditions for perennial species to be seeded within this area. So fire is used to reduce the litter and prepare a seed bed. We know that as junipers increase over time, the understory will decrease, and so you'll lose your shrubs, your grasses, and your forbs will also decrease. The first thing that I think about when I look out at a landscape like this, where we have um, thick juniper encroachment, is 
is just realizing that it wasn't like this 100 years ago. And that the majority of these trees have established within the last 150 years. And so from there, I like to use my 50 year perspective and imagine what it's gonna look like 50 years from now. And when I do that, I can already look over here and see that we're losing our understory species. And that's a big concern for the BLM is maintaining the understory, maintaining the ecosystem function and health. And so I want to do something to, to prevent that. Prescribed burning is a, can be a great tool, but in these kind of systems, uh, it can be very risky. Juniper, surprisingly, does not burn very easily. And so you have to burn it under ex extreme conditions in, in order to get it to, to carry. So what do you mean by extreme conditions? High, high heat, middle of the summer, high winds. When you lose your understory, you have nothing to really carry the fire. And so if you're trying to do prescribed burn in, in a phase three juniper site, you're going to have to recreate a crown fire, okay. which is very risky. One of the reasons we like to use mechanical treatments is that we can guide very specifically exactly where we want the treatment to go on the landscape. If we have an old growth path, patch of trees, we can leave that on the landscape. If there's an individual tree with a wildlife nest that's important, we can leave that tree on the landscape. Okay, so this is uh, an example then of a prescribed burn treatment that you, that you put in. I know that some of the burns that we've been involved with in the past have cost about a thousand dollars an acre to implement mm -hmm. with very mixed results so it's not always the most economical treatment of choice that's one of the other reasons that we um, that we like the mechanical shredding uh, is that we we pretty well know what our costs are going to be associated with that and on average we're paying about two hundred dollars an acre one thing i really like about this viewpoint is that you can see this hillside in front of us that was not treated and you can see the bare understory. Yeah. And as you move your eyes to the left into where it, it burned, you see this phenomenal response in the yeah. understory. You can really see the grasses. It's just a very stark contrast to them. Intervening through restoration, um, some of our primary objectives today, which are different from the past, include maximizing productivity still given this landscape, but also looking at ways to make these ecosystems more resilient. Because we know disturbance will continue to be a pressure in these areas, and we also know that climate will continue to change throughout these areas as it has in the past. So the only way to really ensure the sustainability if we're going to stay on these landscapes and utilize them um, from an agricultural as, as well as other ecosystem services we are gonna to have to build resilience into these communities. So that's really changed um, our perspectives of what we can do on these lands and how we should do it.